with the people that have been here this week. Julie Garfield was here. I tested for John Garfield as a boy in a, in a couple of films. I was extremely young. I didn't get him. But then there was humoresque. Right. And Robert Blake and I played brothers. I believe that Robert played uh, John Garfield as a boy That's in that right. film. That's and right. I, I was his brother. But, uh, you know, I must say, I had wonderful parents. Wonderful parents. And Robert Blake, you know the problems that he's had. He had terrible parents. He was the breadwinner. He was a brilliant young actor. Michael Gub Gubiosi, he was one of the uh, little rascals. Yeah. And uh, he was adorable, and uh, of course, with the Richard Brooks film, uh, he's done some extraordinary work. But they treated him like dirt, and I've always said that because of his unfortunate upbringing, with his mother especially, uh, is what caused him problems later on in life. So your, your experience, and, and we've all heard the, the, uh, the horror, some of the horror stories of child actors, but your experience was positive and you attribute yeah, that to my, your parents. Uh, yeah, my great parents and uh, my cousin who was here, uh, her father was uh, like my second father. My father was sick most of my life. And uh, yeah, and I never wanted to go to a professional school. I wanted to be with normal kids and do the normal things, and uh, so I ended up at L.A. High School, and then I uh, went to UCLA for a couple of years, but I tried to stay normal. I must say, I've been invited to several Western film festivals around the United States as the original Little Beaver, and I took my son, who was just 10 or 11 years old, and my mother kept my original Little Beaver costume. And so I took it with me and I put it on my son. And uh, we went there and they started showing episodes. Um, not uh, just the, the 16 millimeter episodes there. And they asked me to come for some Q&As. So I, I went into the room and they finished with one of the episodes and they were winding it up for the next episode. And somebody asked me a question. And I couldn't talk. I just went, and I finally got a hold of myself, and I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But it put me back in those days, the happiest days of my life. And I just, I wish I could be back there still as a kid working in films. Let's go. One of my favorite films uh, that you also appeared in uh, was Panic in the Streets, directed by Kazan, uh, Paul Douglas, Richard Widmark, uh, in New Orleans, Jack Palance. Uh, what, what was the Kazan experience? Well, very interesting. First of all, I was honored because Dash Kazan had his own stock company of actors back in New York, and he used those. I was the only one from Hollywood that he brought to uh, New Orleans to shoot the film. Number one, Gatch Kazan would bring the actors in and allow the cinematographer to, to, to light the shot. And um, then he would take the actors away and he would start rehearsing the next scene. And then they would say, we're ready, Mr. Kazan. And then he'd bring the actors in and they would shoot the scene. He was always one step ahead. Uh, it, uh, and I used to follow him around like a little puppy dog. He was uh, obviously one of our our great directors. i got to tell you about Jack Palance. It was his first film. He was a former semi-professional fighter at St. Nicholas Arena in New York. He was a tough son of a gun. And he had this shot. We were on this ship right in the harbor there. And he climbed up the mast there. And then they said, cut. Okay, Mr. Palance, you can come down here now because the stunt man is going to come up and there's a little fight scene and stuff and, and he knows how to do that so that no harm will come to you. And so Palance is up there and he says, you got to be kidding. Who do you think I am? Nobody does my stunts. And he wouldn't come down. And so they had it compromise, you know, and let him do some of the work. I recall they let him fall into the water at the end of the picture off that line. It was quite an experience. Quite an experience. And, and also in there, there was uh, two other great films, Battle Cry and Stalag 17. With well, uh, well, Stalag 17, actually I was in the Marine Corps and I had uh, 
a few days uh, uh, that they allowed me to come home and uh, just stuck me in there. I just did a, a small scene. But for Battle Cry, I, um, I was in the Marine Corps um, and I was at Camp Pendleton and Sally Biano, who was the casting director of Warner Brothers, whom I had known, I used to play tennis at Jack Warner's house, right in back of uh, the Beverly Hills Hotel. David Geffen bought his home for $50 million, so you can imagine the expense, at a nine-hole golf course. And did you let, did, I have to ask you, did you let Jack Warner win? Well, <laughs> I played with Jack. And on the tennis court, I would move him around and say, hey, Jack, this is where you stand. Off the court, Mr. Warner, Mr. Warner. I always showed him that respect. He loved, he loved tennis. And so I went and I played the orderly to uh, Van Heflin. And we, uh, we uh, traveled, we went to uh, Vegas Islands in Puerto Rico. And we were supposed to come in. We were on these little pea boats, all with our rifles and our M1s and the battle regalia. Uh, and we're supposed to land in the... The doors open, and we're supposed to go right on the land. And they open the doors, and we're in eight feet of water. And all of us were submerged. But we, in between, we played volleyball. And there were a couple of American Indians in the troop. And evidently, I had said, I had made some nasty remarks or something about how one of the Indians played volleyball. That night, he got drunk and went on the warpath, and he was ready to kill me, and they had to get me and hide me for two days. <laughs> but, um, because my goodness, the people, Tap, Tap Hunter, Perry Lopez, uh, some great character actors uh, in that film. One other thing in Battle Cry, was it Raul? Well, that's Raul Walsh. Raul Walsh, the director. Right, the great Raul Walsh. He was the director of the film. He could care less about the actors and about shooting. It was a paycheck for him, okay? So now we're doing a scene and he's got the Hollywood Reporter that has been shipped down to him, flown down to him. He's reading it. Uh, Mr. Walsh, we're ready for the shot. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, roll him! <laughs> roll him. All right. Action! Okay. Everything go good? Doctor, everything with you? Sound okay? Print it. Let's go. Let's go to the next shot. <laughs> Never looked at the shot. Yeah, I, Rao, I think, was kind of close to the end of his long career. Yeah, he had the patch over yeah, his eye. Right. Never looked at the scene. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Dick Erdman told me when they made Objective Burma and with Errol Flynn and all that, and Walsh directed that, I said, what type of direction did you get from Walsh? He said, two things. We'd get ready to go. He'd say, okay, boys, roll them. Yeah. And then if it wasn't stuff blowing up or yelling, it would say, okay, roll them, easy. Yeah. And that was it. <laughs> when I was doing Cry of the City, I had sort of a short-term contract at Fox, a Panic in the Streets, right. and also Homestretch with Cornell Wilde, who became a wonderful friend, and uh, Maureen O'Hara, Lucky Humberstone, was the director. I played the jockey, the Argentine jockey in it. But they trained me to be a jockey, and they gave me a broken down $25,000 stake horse. Okay, so now for all the long shots, they had real jockeys, you know, doing it. Now they had to have a close-up. So they had about 10 wranglers ready to pick me up. They didn't know what the heck. Nobody knew what was going to happen. And the camera truck is right on the racetrack going about 40 or 50 miles. And I'm telling you, I never had such a, an exciting experience. Those jockeys have got to be the greatest athletes in the world. Even though that horse of mine, you know, was a broken down stakes horse, I never went so fast. And Lucky Humberstone is yelling to me, and my head is right down on the mane of the horse, you know, and I'm holding on for dear life. And he's saying, whip the horse, Tom! Whip the horse! And I'm saying to myself, you stupid SOP, I'm lucky to be on the God bless it horse. I couldn't, I couldn't whip him. I just stayed off the whole time. I tell you what, Tommy, your career, your stories, and the great movie, uh, you have really made the final day of our festival special. That's me, ladies and gentlemen.